chaos loves a vacuum. This podcast is a conscious effort to fight the impending darkness by filling that void with light. These episodes will explore myth, ancient texts, scripture, great works of world literature, and the voices of artists past and present to find the traces, threads, and imprints of the light they left behind. Welcome to Reflecting Light. And now, here's your host, Mandy Green. Hello, my friends. I am your host, Mandy Green, and it is a genuine pleasure to be with you. First of all, I'd like to express a sincere thank you for the initial support of this endeavor. As I recently found out, it takes a lot of resources to get a podcast like this up and running. So if you find this content enlightening and valuable, please consider contributing a couple of dollars. My goal is to make this at least as good as your weekly Big Gulp, and we actually have a small monthly donation size set up just for that. Of course, any donation is appreciated and helps ensure that we can keep this podcast going for a long, long time. For more information about how to donate, to find show notes, or any information about the podcast, the different platforms you can listen on, please visit our website, reflectinglight.org. Of course, the greatest help is for you to subscribe to this podcast, leave us a great rating, and share it with others. All of those go a really long way in helping us get this out there. And I'd like to give a final huge shout out to Lampshade Studio for their graphics and logo design and Plundermine for their audio and technical help. All right, enough business. Let's move on to the content for today. I'm really excited about it. Based on all the events that are swirling around us this year in 2020, I want to just talk a little bit about fortitude. Or if any of you are familiar with Joe Bluth, he would say fortitude with club sauce. Anyway, I just fortitude comes from the Latin word fortis, meaning strong. However, if we look at the full definition in the Merriam-Webster dictionary, it is defined as strength of mind that enables a person to encounter danger or bear pain or adversity with courage. It's also defined as mental or emotional strength. Strength in facing difficulty, adversity, danger, or temptation courageously. Back in the day, the word also could mean someone who puts courage into you. Where do we find this fortitude? Where does it come from? And how is it breathed into us? How is it in the fabric of our being? As Master Yoda says, luminous beings are we, not this crude matter. So to discuss this, I'd like us to go to Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. This is the creation story. Now, creation story is actually riddled. It's been rewritten and redacted and changed over a number of centuries. And so we have to do our best with what's there. Someday, some podcast, we will go into the creation narrative. But for our purposes today, Genesis 2-7, we're just going to take exactly what's in the Hebrew Bible. Now, I am versed in Biblical Hebrew and Koine Greek or New Testament Greek. The reason I took this up is because something inside me knew that there was more to the scripture than we could see and that things weren't being translated together. And when I started to look at these texts critically, I saw that there was a great ocean of meaning behind many of these words and phrases that were being missed by its translation. So the translation I'm using today is mine. Let's read together Genesis 2 verse 7. And Yahweh Elohim. Yahweh is the God of the Old Testament. As a brief synopsis, I'll just say that all of the gods of the Old Testament And we will definitely have an episode about this, about the Deuteronomistic reform. But all of the gods of the Old Testament are conflated. And what that means is that they take all of these different stories and aspects of God and conflate them or put them all into one package and label it Yahweh. But in Genesis, we have this really interesting uh, verbiage that is Yahweh Elohim. So we have Yahweh, which... I would read as Jesus Christ, and then you have Elohim. Elohim is the plural of El. El is God's. Elohim is the masculine plural of God's. It can be applied generally, though, like mankind. So I always translate Elohim as a plural. 
We know that God does not bring to pass his work and glory by himself. The family of God is not created without a woman. There is an equal opposite. And this, I think, is written right into the text that we have a God the Father and a God the Mother. And we have Yahweh. So in this creation process, and if you go back a few verses, it says the God's created, let us make man in our image, our plural image male and female so there you go a little hebrew lesson for for today as well bonus all right so yahweh elohim fashioned or formed or framed man now every hebrew word has many meanings and i find this so rich this is why i love this tradition because there's many ways to read a verse and they all apply they all have truth so the beautiful part is that we can look at scripture a lot of different ways So I think of it being fashioned or formed or framed. If you think about the skeleton and the muscles and the organs and the neurons and the blood flow, it's just really fascinating. Continuing on, Yahweh Elohim fashioned or framed a man out of the dust of the ground. This could also be translated as rubbish. Now, not that you're rubbish. Remember that old t-shirt? When I was in grade school, someone had a t-shirt that said, I know I'm somebody special because God didn't make no junk. But celestial matter is by definition, fading, fleeting, right? It's like the fig leaves. It's not something that's sustainable. So without the spirit, without the breath of life, your body will decompose. It is made of the dirt. All right. We have a man framed out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the Adam, translated as man, but Adam actually in Hebrew means dirt, like a red clayish dirt. So it's this beautiful play on word. And the Adam became a living soul. The word there is soul. Nefesh is the Hebrew word. So out of the earth, the body is formed, But when this breath of life is breathed into it, it becomes an animated, feeling, spiritual being. So this breath of life appears to have properties of immortality, and it really is what brings life to the body. So we have this beautiful breath from the divine that infuses us with light. My contention is that this is where fortitude comes from. That courage was breathed into us the moment we set, well, the moment of our conception in a spiritual sense, and also the moment we breathed in life on this planet. Breath is life. Strength comes from breath. Our breath is literally what powers the rest of our bodies. When the body can no longer breathe, the other organs cease to function. So breath really is a very sacred thing. Um, In a spiritual sense, it's tied to mindfulness and focus, uh, spiritual acuity. That's another topic for another day and one we would hopefully visit, get a great guest like Thomas McConkie. But I want to talk about breath as this divine breath today as something that would infuse you with courage in the face of adversity or temptation or particular challenge. Now, to breathe is to live, but in living, here's the rub. To talk about this, I'd love to reference Shakespeare. Hamlet is one of the great works of world literature, if you ask me. So in Hamlet, Act 3, Scene 1, he states, To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles, and by opposing and them, to die, to sleep no more, and by a sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to, tis a consummation devoutly to be wished." This mortal coil, as he phrases it, is full of heartache and a thousand natural shocks. And we are hit by the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. So how do we find the strength to stay in the game? As always, Jesus Christ is a wonderful, I would say the superlative example of this. 
So I'd like to reference one verse in scripture. It shows up in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And if anyone's filled with this divine breath, with this fortitude that is this God-given gift that's breathed into you. So first, I'd like to look at Isaiah. Now on this podcast, we're going to talk much more of Isaiah. I may even spend a whole year doing Isaiah because I'm translating it right now and I'm finding it's nothing like what I thought it was. However, I digress. Isaiah is actually a critical, critical player in the prophecies about the coming of Jesus Christ and about the prophecies of the last days, both which I think are really relevant to us. We read in 3rd Nephi chapter 20 verse 11 that when Christ visits the Americas, he starts quoting Isaiah and he says, Behold, they are written, ye have them before you, therefore search them. And then later on in chapter 23, verse 1, after he's quoted Isaiah, he says, And now behold, I say unto you that ye ought to search these things. Yea, a commandment I give unto you that ye search these things diligently. For great are the words of Isaiah. There we have a commandment to search the words of Isaiah. See how you're doing there. And maybe we can get you interested in looking at Isaiah. So, Let's go to Isaiah chapter 50. Now, chapter 50 is the third servant song. The prophet speaks of the suffering of the anointed one, or Meshiach, which is the Hebrew word for anointed one. Christos is the Greek word. That's where we get Christ and Messiah from. In verse 7, the servant declares that he will not shrink from performing his mission, despite anything that comes up against him. So this is my translation of Isaiah 57. Because my Lord Yahweh will help me. There's that conflation in there. Because my Lord Yahweh will help me, I will not be disgraced or shamed. Notice that the word Satan means the accuser, right? So think about Christ during these last parts of his life. Really, I would think it would be a constant stream of accusation of shame. Guilt at very best is feeling sadness for something. Shame, God has nothing to do with shame. Shame is about who you are. Guilt is about something you've done. So this shame comes from the accusation of who you are. And I love that the Savior is expressly saying, you can't shame me. I know who I am. Now for the second part. This is the part I'd like to really focus on. I have set my face like flint, and I know I will not be confounded. Confounded can mean thrown into perplexity or confusion. There's no confusion about who he is or what his purpose here is. And he sets his face like a flint. So what does that mean? How can we follow his example Understand that this courage and this fortitude can be breathed into us even in the face or probably shows up most prominently in the face of severe distress, severe trial, severe testing. Flint is a very hard rock and is used to express hardness in the Bible. So for example, in Isaiah 5, 28, flint is a simile for the firmness of horses' hooves. If any of you are horse experts, write in, explain this to me. Figuratively, it can represent the toughness of an impossible task. For instance, in Deuteronomy 8.15, the one who led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water, who brought you water out of the flinty rock, this impenetrable, impossible thing that you would bring water out of that rock. A lot there. Someday maybe we'll revisit it. But the telestial world or the mortal journey is often compared to a wilderness. And if you remember in Numbers 21, there's the serpent that bites and kills and there's certain serpent that's raised up. So there's a lot of beautiful imagery in there if you'd like to look at that further. All right. The last reference is the inflexibility of unwavering determination. 
For this, I would reference Ezekiel chapter 8. In this chapter, the prophet Ezekiel is given a divine calling to speak. It follows this type of ascension pattern where he goes before the king, he's presented with a scroll or something to eat that cleanses his mouth. Beautiful, beautiful language. Um, And incidentally, the Hebrew word for prophet is navi, which means to bubble or gush forth. I love that so much, that truth just spills out of prophets and prophetesses. Let's look at chapter 3, verse 8 through 9. And I'm just going to read the New International Version for this. It's good to read lots of versions of translations of the Bible. I think sometimes by reading it, you may get a different point of view than King James. But the people of Israel are not willing to listen to you because they are not willing to listen to me. For all the Israelites are hardened and obstinate, but I will make you as unyielding and hardened as they are. I will make your forehead like the hardest stone, harder than flint. Do not be afraid of them or terrified by them, though they are a rebellious people. Here, the Lord is clearing the way, this forehead, if you think about that, leading you into battle, leading you into these discussions that he will make you harder than Flynn, harder than the hardest stone, as long as you have this unwavering determination to serve and to speak truth. 800 years before it happened, Isaiah foretold of the Lord's suffering. And as we said, Isaiah 57, because my Lord Yahweh will help me, I will not be shamed. I have set my face like Flint and I know that I will not be confounded. Beautiful language. The book of Luke also references this in Luke chapter 9, verse 51. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. The Greek word there, sterizo, means to set fast or to fix. The eye was on the prize from the very beginning. The cost was irrelevant. How circumstances changed around that was irrelevant. What came as a result of walking into Jerusalem was irrelevant. The purpose was there and his face and his determination was fixed. It's precisely by walking into the fire, taking the hits, the shaming, the torture, and eventual death that Christ was able to overcome all things. He didn't escape them. They weren't taken from him. He wasn't sheltered from them. They all came at him in force. So my question today is, is there perhaps some way that we can find a way to go forward with our chins up and our faces set toward our purpose and take the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune that may come? I've noticed there's a quantum difference in my suffering when I take my battles head on Versus when I crouch up and try to protect my heart. I can just see myself kind of caving in and putting my hands over my heart. And it seems that I suffer more actually from that less courageous approach than when I stand up and I let those arrows land where they, where they may and keep going forward. The amazing Eleanor Roosevelt said, you gain strength, courage, and confidence by every experience in which you really stop to look fear in the face. You must do the thing which you think you cannot do. Eleanor Roosevelt is a hero. She's an amazing woman. Her life was not at all rainbows and lollipops, to be sure. And she found a way to play to her strengths and to face her fears. People were brutal to her, but she's just such a great example of looking fear in the face and doing the thing you think you cannot do. One other verse I'd like to look at is Paul's reflection on this. So if we go to Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14, and this is my translation. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining or stretching after what is ahead, I press on toward the mark or the end mark. Dioko is the prolonged form of dio in Greek, which means this prolonged form of pursuing. It's not just something you pursue momentarily or for a short amount of time. It's this lengthy pursuing, pressing on toward the mark. 
to win the heavenly call or invitation of God in Christ Jesus. Beautiful language. This breath of life powers us. Perhaps in those darkest times is when we find, when we're on our knees, when something's crazy. And I know that so many people have been hit by so many challenges. Uh, My dear cousin buried her husband and she has a very, very autistic child that needs 24-hour care. Three of my in-laws have cancer. One is on his ninth surgery and is fighting brain tumors now. Missionaries being sent home, reassigned, shaken up, you know, loss of jobs, loss of health, being isolated, wearing masks, political uncertainty, fires, just there's a lot coming at us. And how do we take these slings and arrows? My son, I have one son, when he was born, he didn't breathe for a very, very long time. It was terrifying to watch that little body become bluer and unanimated. I think for a minute he got here and thought, I'm not sure I want to do this. He eventually did take that breath, much to my great relief. But I think there are many, many valiant souls out here right now. Our world is in gross opposition to the heavenly environment that we came from. And for many of these teenagers and adolescents and children, I think the juxtaposition is more jarring than it maybe is for us. Heaven was closer and more present than it is. We forget, don't we? So is there a way that we can reflect light by reminding those we love of this divine breath that infuses them, that gives us life and strength and powers us with courage and fortitude to carry on and overcome in the face of adversity? When I served a mission in Moscow, Russia, I was assigned to the beautiful city of Voronezh my very first time. So they put me on a train with my Ukrainian companion, Sestra Gerasimishin, who didn't actually know any English besides what's the matter, baby, that the elders taught her. Still kind of peeved about that. So I had to dig really, really deep. There was nobody and nothing else that I could clean to. But that affliction led me to God. And as a result, it will always be a valuable sacred experience for me. In those dark hours, contemplating what the heck I was doing out there, I actually listened to this song. It's a Disney song from The Rescuers, one of the really great classics, kind of forgotten. I'd like to quote the words of that for all of you. This song really, really spoke to me in those dark moments. It's called Be Brave, Little One. It's written by Shelby Flint. Be brave, little one. Make a wish for each sad little tear. Hold your head up, though no one is near. Someone's waiting for you. Don't cry, little one. There'll be a smile where a frown used to be. You'll be part of the love that you see. Someone's waiting for you. Always keep a little prayer in your pocket, and you're sure to see the light. Soon there'll be joy and happiness, and your little world will be bright. Have faith, little one, till your hopes and your wishes come true. You must try to be brave, little one. Someone's waiting to love you. Sorry, that hits a chord with me. I have two missionaries out right now. We're down to one child at home, and my heart is spread across the world for sure. As a parent, I try to breathe fortitude and courage and strength into those beautiful sons and daughters, all of them out there fighting the good fight. And honestly, the purpose of this podcast is to remind you to tap into that. And perhaps this will breathe some remembrance and light into you as well. I'd like to close with these words from a beautiful American writer, Clarissa Pinkola Estes. She wrote the book, Women Who Run With Wolves. Great title, by the way. Good stuff in there. But she wrote a piece, and I think it's so relevant to this topic and to the situation we find ourselves in. So sit back, enjoy, let's discuss. My friends, do not lose heart. We were made for these times. I have heard from so many recently who are deeply and properly bewildered. They are concerned about the state of affairs in our world now. 
Ours is a time of almost daily astonishment and often righteous rage over the latest degradations of what matters most to civilized, visionary people. You are right in your assessments. The luster and hubris some have aspired to while endorsing acts so heinous against children, elders, everyday people, the poor, the unguarded, the helpless is breathtaking. Yet I urge you, ask you to please not spend your spirit dry by bewailing these difficult times. Especially do not lose hope. Most particularly because the fact is that we were made for these times. Yes, for years we have been learning, practicing, been in training for, and just waiting to meet on this exact plane of engagement. I grew up on the Great Lakes and recognize a seaworthy vessel when I see one. Regarding awakened souls, there have never been more able vessels in the waters than there are right now across the world. And they are fully provisioned. Given provision before you go, if you go out on a journey, sorry, this is my commentary, but it just struck me that if you go out on a journey, you are provisioned before you ever step foot on that boat. Everything's in there that you need. Remember that. They are fully provisioned and able to signal one another as never before in the history of humankind. Look over the prow. There are millions of boats of righteous souls on the waters with you. Even though your veneers may shiver from every wave in this stormy royal, I assure you that the long timbers composing your prow and rudder come from a greater forest. That long grain lumber is known to withstand storms, to hold together, to hold its own, and to advance regardless. In any dark time, there's a tendency to veer toward fainting over how much is wrong or unmended in the world. Do not focus on that. There's a tendency, too, to fall into being weakened by dwelling on what is outside your reach by what you cannot do. Do not focus there. That is spending the wind without raising the sails. We are needed. That is all we know. And though we meet resistance, we more so will meet great souls who will hail us, love us, and guide us. And we will know them when they appear. Didn't you say you were a believer? Didn't you say you pledged to listen to a voice greater? Didn't you ask for grace? Don't you remember that to be in grace means to submit to the voice greater? We know that it does not take everyone on earth to bring justice and peace, but only a small determined group who will not give up during the first, second, or hundredth gale. I might add thousandth or ten thousandth. One of the most calming and powerful actions you can do to intervene in a stormy world is to stand up and show your soul. Soul on deck shines like gold in dark times. The light of the soul throws sparks, can send up flares, builds signal fires, causes proper matters to catch fire. To display the lantern of soul in shadowy times like these, to be fierce and to show mercy toward others, both are acts of immense bravery and greatest necessity. Struggling souls catch light from other souls who are fully lit and willing to show it. If you would help to calm the tumult, this is one of the strongest things you can do. There will always be times when you feel discouraged. I too have felt despair many times in my life, but I do not keep a chair for it. I will not entertain it. It is not allowed to eat from my plate. The reason is this, and here's her mic drop. In my uttermost bones, I know something as do you. It is that there can be no despair when you remember why you came to earth, who you serve, and who sent you here. The good words we say and the good deeds we do are not ours. They are the words and deeds of the one who brought us here. In that spirit, I hope you will write this on your wall. When a great ship is in harbor and moored, it is safe. There can be no doubt. But that is not what great ships are built for. Beautiful words. My dear friends, great ships and great souls are not meant to sit safely in the harbor. We've been launched whether we like it or not. We're in the journey. We're in the ocean. 
or in the waters of chaos, to use an old biblical term. And here we wrestle and fight against powers and principalities and all kinds of things that would actually in turn strengthen us. And we have been provisioned to make that journey and return safely home. My last quote is from Khalil Gibran. I love this. Love, which is God, will consider our sighs and tears as incense burned at his altar, and he will reward us with fortitude. Isn't that beautiful? Every sigh, tear, prayer, cry for help, moment of despair or weakness is burned at his altar and he will reward us with fortitude. So my dear friends, today our message is to breathe life and light into your sails, to remind you of where you came from, who your example is and who stands with you, who has provisioned you with courage and strength in the face of tremendous adversity. May you take the time to look at the ways fortitude has been given to you, perhaps even exploring your most dark or vulnerable times and take notice of it. And then as you are able to let that light shine, as on the deck of your ship, as you navigate these waters and the other great souls you come in contact with, to breathe that light and reflection of the light into the lives of all those you come in contact with, remembering that this is exactly what great ships and souls are built for. That's our message for today, my friends. May you be blessed in these efforts and may light in whatever form it takes shine into your life. Thank you for joining us. We hope this episode lit a spark inside of you. For show notes and other information, please visit our website at reflectinglight.org. If you feel this program illuminated your mind and heart, consider a contribution to fund further episodes. And thanks for listening.